We've reached a place in our calendar year where I think many of us are beginning to feel like it's time to sit down with a professional counselor. So I'd like to read for you a passage from the Code of Ethics for the American Association of Christian Counselors. It states, Jesus Christ and his revelation in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible as the inspired word of God is the preeminent model for Christian counseling practice, ethics, caregiving activities, and the final authority for all matters about which it speaks. Later in that same page, it reads, the biblical and constitutional rights to religious freedom, free speech, and free association protect Christian counselors' public identity and the explicit incorporation of spiritual practices into all forms of counseling and intervention. I'm not going to give you any commentary. I'm just going to say that from the American Counseling Association Code of Ethics, it reads, Counselors have a responsibility to the public to engage in counseling practices that are based on rigorous research methodologies. If you are looking for mental health support this holiday season, first, know the damn difference between these two ideas. And if you still have questions about navigating the world of mental health care in a marketplace that is full of religious charlatans, give us a call because the show is coming right now. Okay, well, welcome to Talk Heathen. Today is Sunday, November 19th, 2023. I am your host, Christy Pell, and joining me today is, I guess, first and foremost, we'll go with Forrest Valkai. Hi! And Jamie Boo! Hey! <laughs> I have returned again. You have returned? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, after a certain yeah. point, you can Good stop thing. announcing it as a return. Turn. You're just oh, here with right. us, I'm right, buddy? Back. I'm back. Every time, they'll, every time they invite me, I show up. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of so course. You thank you for, for piping in. Uh, we are, Jamie and I, here live in studio with a studio audience that we are very excited to introduce you to. Woo! Thank you all for coming and, uh, I guess, I don't know, getting getting ready for Thanksgiving, getting ready yeah. for that time with family, maybe having this as your moment to, like, steal yourself <laughs> for all of that drama. <laughs> enjoying, enjoying your community before you have to uh, suffer through your family, perhaps. <laughs> Or uh, enjoying your community before you enjoy your family. Come on. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I hate yeah. to be so negative about it, but yeah. it is worth noting that this is a time of year where there is a lot of family stress. Mm -hmm. There can be a lot of financial pressures. There can yeah. be a lot of arguing around the table. And Uncle Steve's coming this year. You better watch <laughs> down. He's got some opinions. Oh. Some of them you've heard and dismissed, but he's got <laughs> details now. But he's now. got more. He's got more. Oh, God. He's got a lengthy YouTube video about the latest conspiracy already queued up. He's downloaded it, too, so even if you cut the Wi-Fi, figure it out. <laughs> Not that I've ever done that at a family gathering in order to prevent someone wow, from showing me Wow, that's pretty stuff. brilliant, though. I've, I've taken notes on all I was of this. Say, when I realized I am the tech support for everyone <laughs> at this gathering, and I'd rather not, you know... I just don't know what happened to the Wi-Fi. Why don't we just enjoy each other's companies and play charades? The way Abraham Pictionary. Lincoln would have wanted. Well, yes, and then, yeah, of course, right. they draw a few things that are unsavory as well, like Pictionary. <laughs> so you can't win. But the turkey's always good, so I like this holiday. Well, with that, thank you for spending part of your early holidays <laughs> with us. Yeah. Uh, we are Talk Heathen. Talk Heathen is a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of atheism, critical thinking, secular humanism, and the separation of religion and government. We are a live call-in show with open lines. So get, uh, give us a call. We're at 512-991-9242 or from your computer at tiny.cc slash call th. Lovely, lovely. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, it's amazing so to see someone doing that professionally because every time I host, <laughs> it's a problem. Yeah, 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 oh, words. Yeah, yeah, throwing yeah. that in there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's uh, go ahead and jump in, if we can, to our Talk Heathen to Me segment, where we get into the questions of the week. Uh, last week, we asked, wrong answers only, why did God create humans? Our number three favorite answer came from James West. Why did God create humans? I asked him, and he said, if I tell you, I have to kill you. <laughs> 
pretty good. Yeah, well, pretty good. Plays. Yeah. Number two came from Jason Sherwood, who said, God created humans to serve the true chosen people, cats. <laughs> yeah, that's solid. That plays. Well done. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. serve them medium well, or do you see serve them on, oh, on potatoes? Or? Yeah, all right. More than one say, way to skin a cat. Ever had cat sushi? Not just for fish anymore. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and our favorite answer from this past week came from Colin Matz. The reason God made humans? He had some dust left over after making the universe. Yeah, we all... So we decided to make something say, objectively worse. Yeah, we are just made up of dust. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fair enough. Mm. Okay, well, our question for next week is, why did Christians really burn the witches? You know, enter with your best response in the uh, comments section below. Make sure to chime in before next week. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious from the two of y'all, why did Christians really burn the witches? Because uh, scented candles hadn't been invented yet? <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. I mean, the, the actual answer is to use fear and violence to maintain cultural and religious homogeneity, but like... Okay, I, I would say, right. Maybe it's what because the sexual liberation this. of the witches meant that they weren't afraid to talk about where their spanking stashes were, and they had to conceal that. Maybe that's what it was. Who knows? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we, yeah, we talked about this before the show, Forrest. You are not supposed to make the two of us look stupid just yeah. by being smart. So tone it down. What, what was tone that? Down. We're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna get a bad internet connection really soon yes. if you don't rein it in a little bit. I'm gonna go Gosh. unplug the Wi-Fi, Forrest. <laughs> you and Uncle Steve have driven me to it. All yes. right. Well, we've got some calls stacking up. We do have mm -hmm. some open spots, so I want to jump into the phones really quickly. But before we do, I want to make sure to thank the folks who came in even before a holiday weekend that mm -hmm. have done been working all morning to get everything set up for these shows and show you our incredible crew cam and cast of characters. Thank you all so much for everything that you've been doing. Uh, yeah. Special shout out to uh, to Crew Cat there, who I know is not feeling well today. Uh, all of our love to all of you good people. Thank you very much for everything you're doing. Crew Cat's working hard. Right? Meow, meow. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got uh, a small collection of calls coming in. Do you, where would y'all like to start? Number five. Number five. The All middle right. one. Yeah. Sean in Scotland. What can we do for you today, sir? Hello. Wow. I'm, I'm honored to be on first. Yeah. Uh, Come so in with a math question I'm and I'll pick you first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's about whether or not pi is disjunctive. Mm -hmm. So disjunctive means that in the expansion of it, you can always find any natural number you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for the sequence one, two, three, four, five in pi, you'll always be able to find it. Sure. Uh, well, if and, and this is if, on account of the fact yet. that we understand pi to be infinite. Yeah. Yeah. So theoretically, everything well, will show up eventually. Yeah. Do I have I all mean, this right? Well, no, because uh, one over three, that's infinite and that doesn't repeat. So that, that, on its own doesn't well, it, reply, uh, imply one, what you're One at. over three repeats at a single digit, and I know that pi doesn't uh, repeat a sequence of patterns, but unless it was perfectly random, it might not hit uh, every possible combination of uh, different characters. And I, uh, the math to either demonstrate that that's true or not true with a proof is at the present moment above my pay grade, but I'm interested to hear what you have to say, Sean. Well, there is a counterexample to the idea that uh, a number repeats, uh, number never repeats, and yet is infinite, and yet is not disjunctive. Mm. So, if you picture the number that starts with zero in the first decimal place, then one, then two zeros, then two, mm -hmm. then three zeros, then one, then uh, four zeros, then two. Mm -hmm. Or forget the two. Just put, I'm really nervous. Sorry. Oh, you're you're, <laughs> you're good. Start you're out with. You've done more uh, math one prep zero, than the three of us combined, one, so you're one, good. One. <laughs> uh, two zeros, one, uh, three ones. So it repeat. It 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 starts. Uh, okay, so it alternates between zero and ones, and for each mm -hmm. uh, alternation, you do the number of. Uh, that in in particular one, so it would be uh, mm -hmm. zero point zero one zero zero one 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 zero 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 
zero one 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 zero 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 and then seven one infinite non repeating but not uh, random. I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm following your criteria here. This is a, the number that you're describing uh, has an infinite number of, dum- of uh, decimal places. It is not repeating, but it's it, not. Uh, it's also not it's random. Not it's not random, but pi is not random either. We don't know whether or not pi is normal in that sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we? I mean, I, I, uh, so my understanding of pi was that different, uh, like a randomly selected segment of 100 digits of pi could be used as a statistically random uh, sample. But I, I don't know that for sure. There's a distinction, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, what gets me is that, like, it's, 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 I just Googled it to double check. And it looks like we've calculated 31.4 trillion digits of pi thus far. And like, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, we haven't found a repeated sequence or like a, a really, what we could call a pattern, I guess, like a repeated sequence is, is one, one, two, three, a repeated sequence. And maybe that's in there. Tw- you know what I mean? But like, it's like a pattern, a proper pattern, as far as I know, hasn't been identified yet in 31.4 trillion digits am i right about that so we, we don't know that it's random yeah, but I, it I seems like it I can go could be from actually. what we can see um, yeah so there's um a library of online integer sequences it's called well the online encyclopedia of integer sequences oh are you on uh, the oeis.org as well right now <laughs> <laughs> yes i am i'm looking hey. at that now uh so if you look up the sequence a03 6903. It's a scan of the digital expansion of pi until all n digit strings is, has been seen. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And it's based on this sequence that they make the conjecture. So they haven't proven it yet, but it's based on this sequence that I cited that they've made the conjecture. Mm. So I will say, I, I looked on the, uh, the OEIS and um, wanted to re-familiarize myself, because I'm sure at one point I knew uh, a better definition of disjunctive, or the the, the definition that you uh, so expertly provided, but um, in, in terms of uh, reference to pi, it said that it's not uh, known, and it has a citation. Obviously, I'm looking at something that's an open source that probably only math nerds have uh, ever edited, but I'm not sure that it can be stated that pi is definitively not disjunctive. It it seems to me, from everything that I've read about it, is that it's one of those things that like we could it hasn't been proven one way or the other but how on earth could you possibly prove it if it's supposedly and inf- you know if it's an infinite number how Correct. how could you ever check well, you'd, you'd be surprised you can what mathematicians can prove constant. right well, it's, it's just one of those things that is it, again i'm not a mathematician i'm a biologist but like it's if if so this is outside my field there's probably some literature about this that i haven't heard of but the way that i heard it presented in you know kind of layman's terms in undergraduate courses is that this is one of those things that's kind of just a truism that like if you it, because this isn't just a sequence of ones or zeros like you 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 know suggested or or uh, repeating digits of three you know like you suggested sean with like things that are infinite but non-random but also don't include all digits but because this is something that includes all possible digits and is non-random as far as we know so far, and we do know goes on forever, probably, mostly because it's irrational. Like, it kind of just logically follows that that would almost certainly be the case, although it's not something that could ever really accurately be tested. But it's it's not a mathematical proof. Right, it's not a mathematical proof. It's just kind of a truism, you know? Yeah, it's a conjecture. It, it's it's a guess so far, but it's a very very h- highly informed guess. And right, so so like just as an example of this, you know, I there, there you talked about the library of infinite numbers you were looking at. Here I've got the library of Babel.info. It's a place that anybody can go look up if you want. They take just the letters of the alphabet and I think a couple of punctuation marks right now, um, and they're just arranging every possible configuration of the letters of the alphabet and whatever punctuation they have. And the goal is that if this project was completed, we would have every possible book ever written that ever could be written, every possible word, phrase, anything ever that could ever be said, everything 
would be contained within this library. Um, and just to, as a, you can go in here and you can look up the search feature and type in whatever the hell you want and you'll find it. I just typed in forest Valkai is actually a mass of squirrel flesh in the shape of a YouTuber. And I found not one, but two different places in this sequence where that's, uh, it's, it's already been typed out in this because it's just every possible configuration of the English alphabet and whatever else. And so like, this is kind of the same thing with pi is that like if it's every possible configuration of numbers repeating infinitely which it seems like it probably is then it stands to reason that you'd likely be able to find any sequence of numbers ever in there that doesn't mean that it's useful you know, it, something that does contain everything also contains nothing you could never know how to actually search sure. it it's, it's insane it doesn't mean that it's useful or helpful or functional or or really means anything it just, as far as I know, is something that's uh, untestable, okay. unproven, but seems uh, likely. Well, I, I you know, in defense um, of Sean here, uh, Forrest. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, Sean. I'll, I'll let you respond first, but then I, I I'm going to disagree with my co-host here somewhat. Which is <laughs> Please do. Simply because a, a number is. Uh, a, irrational and mm -hmm. uh, uh, random in terms of its expression doesn't mean that it's a disjunctive or rich number. True. Um, additionally, you not knowing whether or not there's a mathematical proof to determining the, the digits of this doesn't mean that there isn't necessarily. Um, right. And there's, there's all kinds of math uh, proofs. The more that you look into it where you realize, wow, there's really something here. It is, in, in a certain sense, the hardest of sciences, harder than diamond or steel. Um, but I'd, I'd push back on that. Well, it seems to be this way. Yeah, it, it would seem to be this way. And I would say, for us that that would be the beginning of an inquiry into the mathematical proofs of non-repeating uh uh oh god now i've lost my math vocabulary <laughs> well, no, 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 numbers, as a liberal arts major irrational. let me bring sean back <laughs> into this conversation really quickly uh, and yeah. uh, and and just check in sean on on how all of this is landing for you uh and then i would like to maybe just chat a little bit about about why it matters and about mm -hmm. why yeah. we are so obsessed with perplexed by why humans just seem to fall into the void when we start to look too closely at infinity uh, uh, Sean, uh, how is all of this sitting with you? Uh, I think that I, I'm making progress. I'm trying to get my point across. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been messaging um, via uh, different um, uh, YouTube things and via X, as they call it these days, and uh, trying to get uh, Forrest to, to recognize this. He's a, he's a public scientific figure, and uh, I think that it's important that he needs to. What well, he 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 puts this across, you know. Are you still there? You can't quiet. Yeah. No, we, we we're just listening. Okay, good. We're, for for once, we're not being assholes and talking over you. Is all the difference here? <laughs> uh. Yeah, and also I think it's really important because there are a lot of misunderstandings about infinity, and uh, I I I'm um, a PhD student and I I've been studying maths for a long time and. I, I'm very passionate about the subject, and I, I, I can't miss an opportunity to speak about it with people, you know? Um, I, I get that. And I, 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 I just got to say something. I can't let this go. One thing. You said that, okay, what is the use? Well, mm, um, uh, do you know Hardy's A Mathematician's Apology? It's uh, a book uh, written in... I think like the 50s, something like that. And it attempts to explain why pure mathematicians do what they do. Mm. And he gave an example that he thought will have no practical application. And he just thought, oh, isn't this thing beautiful? It's, you know, it, it, we study it for its own sake. But now these days, the very um, uh, uh, security of the internet is based on these theorems that he cited as not having any use. So we don't know what the future use of, of a, a pure mathematical statement will be in the future. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just thought I'd raise that point. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely a defender of science, uh, no matter what its supposed functionality 
is on the surface and whether or not we feel like we can apply it. I definitely, as a member of the ultra soft sciences and particularly as a clinician, I am always asking myself like, okay, how can we use this information to make the world a better place in order to allow people to be happier, to be free from harm and, and these kinds of things. But that doesn't mean the pursuit of these questions of infinity is not significant. Uh, all of that said, we're, uh, we're 20 minutes into the show and we're talking a lot of numbers. Is there anything else that feels important before we jump into maybe a little more well-grounded conversation as much as I appreciate your time, Sean? Uh, I don't know what else to say. Uh, thank well, you for taking my call. I suppose this is a good place to to. to to, to con be continued. Well, well, thank you. Yeah. So right. what I will say is... Jamie, I, I see you chomping at the bit. Get it out. Let's do it. I was going to say, I would love to stay in touch as the study of mathematics, while it's not a professional or PhD level for me, is as much a passion as a person that didn't pass calculus uh, can, can be <laughs> passionate about math. And in my defense, I had other personal things going on at the time, but we'll, we'll have to find some way to chat. I think there's probably a, a discord at the end of it. And uh, I didn't remember necessarily the book written in the 50s that was a mathematician's apology. Uh, a ma a mathematician's apology. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, cool. Well, it, it will be one of many big books that I read you know, over the course of the next 12 months, I'm sure. But I'd love to stay in touch. Cool. Yeah. I, I definitely appreciate like the conversation about it, and especially you know, Jamie. You, I, I appreciate you uh, pointing out the fact that me saying like this is likely to be the case. Yeah. That you're right. That isn't a whole argument, and I I, I, I apologize if I framed it as such. Uh, you soft I, scientist with your <laughs> seems like and your biology. I'm, I'm used right. to talking to people about how numbers make them feel. So right, this, is, right. this is all a little different for there's me. No, there's no yeah, feelings is, in math. There's no crying right. in baseball. The, the, uh, the issue is for me that that uh, numbers don't have genetics or behaviors that I can recognize and and do do statistics on. You know what I mean? So it's kind of as it's it's hard for me to wrap my head. But like this is you know the 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 way that I've heard it for so long, and it's very 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 likely that what I learned was a very dumbed down version of of a much more expansive topic meant for people like me who aren't majors in this area that aren't studying this kind of thing that are just interested in weird shit about the universe so like yeah i'm always hold down for it hold on to that speech that forrest just gave i suspect what? it's going to come up and be very useful tool for us to hold on to for later because <laughs> uh, sometimes we do have things explained in that sort of like broad down sense down and they're very not, reductionist they're not yeah yeah accurate but that yeah. doesn't mean they're true uh right you know i'm I'm looking at yeah. some of the calls in the queue, I just can't help but feel I'm like wondering if that there. isn't going to come up. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, so, Sean, thank you so much for your time. You have a, a wonderful day. We're going to take some other calls here, but first I want to make sure people know about the new way that we can support the ACA. Uh, you can buy an engraved brick and become part of this library's legacy. Let's check out that video. Have you ever wanted to make a permanent impact on the atheist community of Austin? Help support our space for free thought by buying a custom engraved brick to be laid on the building grounds to help raise funds for improvements. Our building has stood as a beacon for years, bringing people together. But three years of emptiness due to the pandemic have taken a toll, leaving it in disrepair. Help us restore this hub of connection and support by buying a brick. Moses had his stone tablets, but we're doing our own version. Join our brick fundraiser and let your engraved messages stand the test of time minus commandments. Visit tiny.cc forward slash ACA bricks for more information. Everybody should buy a brick with Christy Powell's name on it. Everybody <laughs> do should it. do that. Do it. Yes. That would do it for me. Amazing. <laughs> Other ways yes. you can support the organization. Uh -huh. You can go to tiny.cc slash merch ACA to get a new limited edition t-shirt or join our street team by going to tiny.cc slash ACA flyers where we have uh, printable call-in flyers to try and bring people to the show. Post these with permission to community bulletin board and wherever else he can so that people will call in and defend their faith. 
All right. I am excited about some of these conversations. I think that we're going to get into. I also just want to point out that somebody, that one of the the mods in the chat said, did you know if you send a super chat, you know, uh, Christy Forrest and Jamie might read it on air. If you send in a brick, we might read that too. Just throw them (laughs) straight towards us. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. (laughs) Hold on a second. (laughs) Send in money for the bricks. Don't, we don't want your used bricks. Thank you. (laughs) Used bricks. There's, you know, yeah, there's something about atheists being mailed breaks i feel like that could just go <laughs> sideways save, too quickly save your money on postage <laughs> for the brick all right yeah. well we are going to speak to angel in ireland uh about feminism and biology angel what is on your mind today hi um sorry can you guys just give me two minutes i just need to go into another room if that's okay um, yeah, let yes, me... but that's because I've, oh, you were going to read the description that she provided, and then I was going to say, <laughs> quick, in before Forrest hits with the science, this is what I think. Um, but if you wanted to read the description, so there was some context <laughs> my absurd. We are well. all over the place. Uh, no, I'll tell oh, you what, yeah. I, uh, give yeah, me your so speech. Uh, the, so um, let's set up this well, topic so for Angel. The, the description that we were given by the call screener uh, was, feminism and biology, is patriarchy natural? Um, And I would say that uh, the existence of bonobo societies that are matriarchal would demonstrate that while there are examples of patriarchal or something like it, uh, uh, societies uh, amongst primates, there's also examples of matriarchal ones. Additionally, those are things that formed in a previous to the mastery of electricity and technology world before we started artificially creating our own concrete jungles when we lived in actual jungles and actual plains. And so I would say, yes, kind of, but so is cancer. Uh, Something being natural doesn't make it good or necessary. But uh, I have a co-host that's got way more insider knowledge on biology and primate societies, uh, despite the textbooks that are on my bookshelf. So I'd throw it to either uh, Angel, our caller, if she's ready, or to Forrest. Yeah, a- like Angel, why don't you talk. walk us through your, your question, your thought here. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to say that I'm a huge fan of you guys, specifically Forrest. He's been such like a huge part in my deconstruction journey. So well, thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Your videos are absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you so much. So it really means a lot I, to me. <laughs> of course. So um, one of the things the hardest things to deconstruct is misogyny. And um, like, obviously there is like religious misogyny, you know, um, Adam and Eve and all that stuff, but there's also misogyny that's in within like science. So like I went on a date recently, it was terrible. And the guy was basically saying that patriarchy is natural you can see uh, it throughout human history uh, you can see it within the ultimate, the uh, the animal kingdom he was no. talking about uh this is first date about, material like, there is an open and, class day too and he was yeah. talking about like alpha males and all that uh, did he call himself stronger, alpha smarter. Point. it's not a coincidence that the greatest leaders in the animal kingdom and in human history are men and did, I did he stop? Did he stop listening to Andrew Tate while you were talking to hear you, or was he doing it the whole time? Was it? <laughs> yeah, and um, not even that, but also like I have like my younger cousins who are on social media, and they're hearing all this young stuff that misogyny is built into men. It is their biological mm. instinct, mm. and from a bio, from a bio, a biologist perspective. What is your thoughts on this? And what are some rebuttals that I can use to oppose this? That's my whole thing. Yeah, so I think Jamie actually started perfectly is the fact that like we are primates and there's lots of different kinds of primates. And some of them, like gorillas, for example, and and chimpanzees, do have a pretty patriarchal society where you have like the big, strong uh, uh, males leading the way. Um, But there's also other primates that aren't that way. Uh, for example, lemurs. Lemurs are all matriarchal. You have the 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 the, the female running the group. Um, uh, bonobos are another great example, which are, are predominantly matriarchal, um, overwhelmingly bisexual, just interesting apes. Um, and so you have a lot of examples of that. But that brings with it the baggage of saying, okay, well, if different types of primates have different societies, which one do humans have? We can't say, well, lemurs do it that way, so we should too. What what are we looking like? 
And it just so happens that in pretty much every goddamn way of, of, of dimorphism and of, of you know, uh, either behavioral or, or phenotypic uh, 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 dimorphism, we land kind of right in the middle of, of what everybody else is in terms of the primates. Um, and we also see that even in species specific groups, there's still an air of culture that's really meaningful. So there's this uh, neuroendocrinologist out of Stanford University uh, named Robert Sapolsky. So he's very famous because he's super freaking cool. Um, and Robert Sapolsky, one of his most famous things that he talks about, an experiment that he was doing, or really not an experiment, an observation that he had, is he was in Kenya studying all the baboons. Um, and you have this troop of baboons that's just like the most basic standard off-the-shelf baboons, um, where you have the big, strong alpha quote quote males which that's a bullshit term but we'll get to that later um these big strong males that are uh, dominating everybody and then you have all the females and all the weaker males that are being beat up and picked on all the time um and then one day there's a like tourist restaurant that has a bunch of meat that's infected with tuberculosis and they throw out all this old meat that they can't use anymore and the baboons get into it um and of course the big strong you know macho baboon males at the top are the first ones to eat and they eat the most and overnight 50 percent of this troop dies um and all almost all of the deaths are among these big strong alpha males um and so you'd expect that in this situation that the next males in line would become the big bullies and would start beating up on everybody. Um, but in turn, it, it, it turns out they don't at all. They continue doing exactly what they've been doing, which is grooming each other, which is a big uh, social capital in, in, in this, you know, uh, primate society in general, but it's, you know, with these baboons, especially um, they're grooming each other. They're nice to each other. They're they're The cortisol stress hormone levels go down in the whole group as a whole. Um, Nobody becomes the big angry evil male anymore. And when other baboons come in trying that, they all shut it down and they're like, we don't do that here. That's not us. And it takes the entire population of that troop turning over, dying off and a new generation coming in before they start going back to their quote, quote, natural instincts. If baboons can figure it out, humans fucking can too. We can figure out how to overcome if it what instinct says and do what's actually best for everybody. Um, none of that says anything to whether or not there's any actual instinct in human males to be domineering or patriarchal or, 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 you know, bombastic or predatory or any of these other ridiculous things that people try to come up with. There fucking isn't as far as I know. Um, but even if there were, that's not an excuse. If we're a species that can put robots on Mars, we're a species that can learn to keep it in our pants and keep our hands to ourselves. That's my opinion on it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, the, it, it, all that is to say, not only is there no evidence for what this person is saying, but also it's a craptacular argument on a good day. Mm. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cause, um, I heard, I heard this like over and over again and yeah. it's just like a prevalent talking point on like yeah. social media. It makes for a nice and sound bite. It, it's yeah, really, it, it, it's yeah. really simple. It's really straightforward. Uh, you can disseminate these ideas very, very quickly, and it actually takes a lot of know-how to be able to slowly debunk them. So, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. I think we're going to see these notions continue to spread. Yeah. And it's worth pointing out that they're just not well grounded factually. I mean, they're really e not. Yeah. yeah. Even if we sort of allow for a lot of the different pieces of bullshit that just came up, it's worth acknowledging that even in like strongly patriarchal species, patriarchal doesn't necessarily mean might makes right. You know, right, the right. alpha male is not necessarily the biggest, strongest, chest thumpingest person there. It's likely the male who has the best relationship with the alpha female. It's likely the male who has the greatest political mind and the most sophisticated understanding of all of the different uh, favor giving and all the different relationships and all these different connections. There's so much intricacy to animal behavior to the human animal behavior and this notion that well because naturally blah 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 violence is just ridiculous on its face 
it, it also, yeah, you know, I know I rambled for a long time, but if I can add just a couple more quick things, because you like you bring up some great points there, is that number one, the whole alpha male thing comes from a bullshit debunk study on wolves from like the I think it was like the nineteen seventies or something. I, I can't remember, mm. but it was it, it's not a real concept in like lots of species. Everybody thinks it has to do with wolves. It doesn't. And then they try to do the thing that I was talking about earlier where they're like, well, wolves do it this way. So humans do too. And what it ends up being is the same kind of nonsense thinking that gives rise to things like social Darwinism and stuff where they're like, here's this very rudimentary concept in biology. If I apply that to culture, that means that I get to beat my wife, you know, and, and they just want to go with that. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and then also, I want to point out the fact that, you know, anthropology as a study, the, and not just people think of anthropology as just studying like grass stir, skirts and dances and stuff. There's different fields of anthropology, biological anthropology, the study of the human animal, our evolution, our behavior, our biology today. Um, like that's that field was started by literally Victorian men with literally Victorian ideals. Um, and because of that, there was a long dark history of, of these scientists across biology, but especially in bioanthropology, glossing over facts that they didn't like, literally destroying evidence that went against their Eurocentric white national, or a uh, white supremacist, Christian, uh, uh, heteronormative, cisgendered worldview. Um, they would destroy evidence that went against it. They would destroy people that went against it. Um, they would go out into communities and be like, you, man, how do you run this village? And the man would be like, actually, she runs the village. And he'd be like, don't be stupid. How do you run the village? And like that, that's something that happened quite a bit in the same way that, that you know, Europeans genocided their way across the, the globe and destroyed whole cultures. Scientists destroyed a lot of evidence of those cultures as well. And we are now going back and re like re looking at a lot of things and find out that there isn't a lot of evidence for a lot of the assumptions that we made. Um, and you can see the, the, the roots of that rot when you read the comment sections on popular science magazines to talk about it. You know, uh, uh, popular mechanics, I think just a little while ago posted an article talking about the growing evidence from, from, you know, of what we call feminist archeology, span which is an upsettingly recent uh, topic. Um, where we're showing that actually not all of the hunters were men and all of the gatherers were women. There was actually a tremendous amount of crossover there. Yeah. And that, you know, the women weren't just at home weaving baskets. They were actually out there working and hunting. And you really look at the comment section on those things. I know this because I just happened to see one the other day. And they're like, oh, you're telling me all these people are just out there fighting mammoths while pregnant? Because every woman is pregnant all the time because yeah. that's all they think women are for. Um, and like it's yeah, there's just there's so much mounting evidence against this idea. And when we look at the evidence for it that we've been espousing for the past couple of decades, it, it or a couple of centuries, really, uh, it's it's thin if it's there at all. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in terms of biology across the animal kingdom and in terms of just humans, there's really no reason to say that patriarchal societies, um, predatory, domineering, aggressive, might makes right type shit uh, has any naturalistic roots. It's just what's been overwhelmingly successful because it's so incredibly violent and that doesn't make it acceptable or something that we should be looking towards the future with. That, that it, it, You don't get something new by trying the same thing over and over. And if you want a better world, maybe we shouldn't be doing the same crap that got us here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ad ad yeah. Adapt and, and change to changing circumstances, particularly when Precisely. we change them, uh, it, our species changes them as much as they are. Um, Forrest has given you a pretty good background on the biology, just in terms yeah, Sorry of for talking so long. Oh, no, 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 no. Every, every word worth it. But in terms of the argument, this is one of those really pernicious arguments that we're going to be with for a long, long, long time because it contains all of the things that make it difficult to respond to. It contains a broad generalization, oh, men do this. Well, sure. you yeah. can find basically any behavior and say, men do this. Men wear dresses. Men wear pants. Men don't wear dresses. In a certain sense, in the sense that they're using that phrase, all of those statements are true because the term men 
is so loose and poorly defined. It's like, oh, let me think broadly about this category, this heuristic that's been in our brain since we didn't really have frontal lobes in broad categories of people. And so a statement like, well, men really annoy me, or men are smelly, or I wish that men had greater muscles and wore shirts less often, can all be true statements, right? And in fact, for me, they often are. But it doesn't make any sense for the sort of assumptions that follow that on uh, in popular conversations, whether it's over a beer or on Twitter, to then say, oh, well, it's natural, it's a part of men's instinct, therefore our society should respond to it. If I'm going to be in favor or opposed to some policy or some shift in society, I need something other than bar stool wisdom to persuade me that any individual specific policy is a good idea or not. And it just sort of sounds like the same kind of complaining generalization that you would hear from someone that would say, well, kids these days, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing the other. Men these days are not like men used to be. Well, yes, there's new trends in society. There's new things that happen. And again, we don't really depend on hunting and gathering the way that we did. Less than 1% of the population in my country are farmers. And to be clear, that's the sort of one job that defines when civilization begins, when you control the food. There's a lot of people that are men, that are manly men, that work on Wall Street and that couldn't cook for themselves even if they tried. So the idea of what makes a man a man, or, or whatever it is that they're getting at, or what behavior should be acceptable when we're talking about men, is something that's an issue for social concern, but it doesn't even, to me, rise to the level of a scientific claim. And that's a very, very, very difficult thing to point out, especially if you can only use 280 characters. So in forums where there isn't really the basis for a good, in-depth, specific argument, like Twitter, like social media, where it's not people looking each other in the face and trying to understand each other, we're going to get arguments like this for a long time. So I'd say you know, uh, batten down the hatches and strap in because you're going to be given various responses like the ones we've heard today and like the ones that you've said for a long time. And I salute you for it. It's part of the reason I don't spend as much time on Twitter as I used to. Smart move. Yeah, good thinking. Uh, Angel, we have hit you with just a lot of information yep. there. How is all of this sort of settling in for you? How does all that feel? Um, well, it feels amazing. I have learned a lot. But um, the only question I have left is how does like testosterone actually work? Because they use that word a lot and they associate it with like masculinity. Yeah, the more testosterone, the more manly of a man you are for men to be men. Right. Like, how, like, how does it actually work and like what's the misconception? Can you guys explain that to me if you don't mind? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, uh, it reduces your... Uh, actually, I'm going to let you jump into all this for us. I'm sorry, I was getting some notes from the uh, crew. No, I, I, I bet you're about to say the same thing that I am, is because it sounded like you were. It reduces the threshold for aggression is, is what is often said. Um, and so like I, I, I'm not an endocrinologist. I'm going to give you a very layman's summary of this. Testosterone is uh, important for a couple of things. One is for, for phenotypic virilization, which is uh, what you would call um, producing a male phenotype, male anatomy. Um, and this is really important when we talk about, you know, especially in biomedical science, especially when we're talking about anatomy, especially when we're talking about um, uh, uh, human populations, you'll often hear distinctions where we say, phenotypically male versus anatomically male versus genetically male versus this male that way it's there's distinctions here so when we talk about testosterone um this is a hormone that causes virilization is, is male development but it also is constantly functional in your brain um and the common misconception is that it makes you violent and angry and all these different things and what it actually appears to be, from my understanding of it, again, not an endocrinologist, this is just what I got out of my you know, labs in this, is uh, that it, it, it just reduces the threshold for those kind of behaviors in some ways. Um, and it does a lot of other stuff too. Uh, pretty much all of endocrinology and pretty much, all, which is the study of, of you know, hormones and, and, and cell signaling, things like this, um, and in pretty much all of neuroscience as well. Anytime you ever hear somebody say this one thing does this one thing, they are absolutely leaving out just mountains of stuff. Like if you say the, the amygdala in the brain controls fear and aggression, 
Well, there's like 80 other freaking things that it does <laughs> that are all very nuanced and important. And it's the same thing with testosterone. So anybody who uses testosterone as an excuse to be an asshole uh, is, is doing thinking wrong. Um, it does a lot of really cool stuff. And I've got a really cool clip. I'm actually going to try to pull it up here. Of I talked about Robert Sapolsky a little while ago. I've got a clip of him on, I think, the Huberman podcast talking specifically about testosterone and how misunderstood it is. I'm going to try to find that. And if I can find it, I'll put it down here in the chat. Yeah, I, w I will say just touching on one phrase that he said is anyone that's using, and then he said testosterone, as an excuse to be an asshole, you can pretty much put any word in there. Anyone that's using insert any word or phrase or ideology as an excuse to be an asshole is missing something for me, which is the part where you shouldn't be an asshole. <laughs> Additionally, I think it is actually in some ways a sign of positive progress in our society that this is the argument we're hearing. Because the people that come to the conclusion, no, men are like this, men are tough, men have the biggest muscles, men should be in charge of things because they're stronger, etc., have been that viewpoint has been around for quite some time. It's always been wrong, but it's been around for quite some time. And now our society has progressed enough, has become slightly more scientifically literate, that now they have to actually borrow words from biology to continue being wrong about how some humans work. Yeah, some it. effort yeah. to justify it. Some effort to justify it. It's uh, uh, based on, oh, I heard a word. Oh, that word is associated loosely with some things that I think of as macho. Therefore, I'll just talk about testosterone, testosterone, testosterone. And it is the same sort of misunderstanding that's led people to tell me, oh, no, don't eat that. It's giving you too much estrogen. You're going to grow tits and become a woman or something. Which, um, if it was that easy to swap your gender, <laughs> And Seriously. I also don't understand why those people are so objectionable about people swapping their gender. If all I had to do was eat soy and then I was suddenly a woman and every trans person uh, just ate soy or ate, I don't know, whatever it is, super macho Alex Jones sold me this man pills or whatever, then could you really object to such a simple process? It, it, it's complicated. They've got both estrogen and adrenaline and testosterone and a thousand other things going on in their system right now, and so do you. But they've found this shorthand with a science word to make the same arguments that have been foolish for the last hundred years. So really, Angel, I think it comes down to filtering out your dates based on their media diet. You know, I, I hate to go there, but I mean, that, that's a little bit of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope that all of this has been helpful. I know we've been uh, covering a lot of different inf bits of information. And I just posted oh into the God. chat a, a YouTube short and a 90-minute podcast I was talking about. Both are from that guy that I was mentioning, where he has a very brief definition of testosterone and the way that it changes aggression thresholds and a more detailed, thorough explanation of all the different ways that things like estrogen and testosterone work in the brain and in behavior and things like that and why they're important for ways that we don't take into account. So those are both in the chat now. You can go check those out if you want. All the ways we know about so far. Yes, yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, Angel, I'll give you the last word here. I really appreciate your patience with us as we all kind of geek out about a topic that I, <laughs> I think we're all, like, very excited about. Yeah. We just love that test. Okay, story. well, thank you so much. I've actually learned so much. And, um, yeah, I think I've just learned so much. And it's such an honor to get so many words from wisdom, and especially backed up with scientific evidence as well. So... Thank you so much. I'm glad. Thank you. Glad I'm also hear. putting one more thing in the chat. It's a <laughs> paper from John Speth, um, and it's a, it's called Gray Things and Brown Things, Reflections on the Role of Ethnographic Realm and the Interpolation of the Paleolithic, uh, Paleolithic Archaeological Record. Um, and he's kind of – the whole paper is something I had to read in arc theory class in grad school, and, like, it – it's just ripping to shreds these rudimentary ideas of, of a lot of things in archaeology. But a, a, one major part of this is talking about, you know, sex roles and, and patriarchy and whatnot, which all comes from this one dude named Binford, who was like the standard name that everybody knew in, in processional archaeology, uh, archaeological theory. This paper just rips it all apart based on the evidence that we have now. So check it out. It's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to stress here that the message is not trust the science or don't trust the science. It's trust all of the science because science mm -hmm. is about 
<laughs> not trusting the science. It's about scholastic infighting. It's about developing new information. And we are at a very uncomfortable moment in our history where we're kind of starting to look backwards and realize just how much bullshit we've been fed even by the scientists as uh, we look at some of the ethnographies and, yeah, just the, the different sort of influences. Uh, interesting to realize that uh, feminist archaeology is becoming more of a thing. But mm -hmm. with uh, all of that, let's talk to uh, Steve in Austria who has some interesting questions about, uh, I suppose, genetics. Uh, Steve, what's on your mind today? Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I had a friend over a few days ago and he made some slightly transphobic comments about uh, not having them, having trans, trans persons uh, register their original genetic makeup when they were, when they were born. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we discussed this a little bit and I knew about uh, uh, some aberrations of, of this uh, um, that for the for my argument, I will use male for X, uh, XY and female for XX. If that's okay, um, I feel like that can get us into trouble. Uh, you you talked about some amount of variation or some amount of exceptions. I forget the exact phrase, but I, I'll tell you now that phrase is covering a great multitude of sins because there are quite a many aberrations or uh, at least different forms that our genetics can show up in. But please uh, continue with uh, with your question here. Uh, and that that uh, is my question actually because I found aberrations that uh, m males uh, under under quotation marks can have XXY for example like mm -hmm. Kleinfelter and I found a female aberration um, that uh, women can have one X chromosome or three or four but mm -hmm. is there any so and and that leads me to the question if the Y part of the chromosome could be used uh, in the in the wrong way um in my opinion uh to to distinct male from female no 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 not a lot of the time so, so well, okay so this is one of the things that when, when earlier on when we were talking about math and whatever and christy said you know i imagine there's going to be a few times in this uh, when we were talking about like <laughs> very basic rudimentary kind of a learning level of this and like how that's kind of bullshit when you get the big picture this is one of them so like the the argument to say you can use xy in place of male and xx instead of female sure most of the time a lot of the time sure and that's the key is that you know the, the common argument when we talk about intersex people in this way um is that someone will say well, you know, what if, if a person is born without one arm? Can we not say that humans have two arms? Of course you can. You just add the modifier, most humans have two arms. Mo in general, humans have two arms. By and large, humans have two arms, right? It, it, typically, humans have two arms. I try to avoid the word normally because that has some cultural implications to it about what's you know good and proper and normal. But like, yeah, m most of the time, sure. But that doesn't mean it's not important when that isn't the case. There's millions and millions and millions of people out there where that isn't the case. So you talk about you know the Y chromosome in specifics. Well, you could have De La Chapelle syndrome, where you're a male, where either all or part of the SRY gene from the Y chromosome transfers over to an S X chromosome, and so you actually have XX allosomes, but you still have male development. And there's even other ways where that does, because then you can just move the, the definition and say, oh, well, it's the SRY gene that does it. There's other ways that go without the SRY gene where you can have epistasis, you can have something upstream, because the development of a male or female phenotype is actually a long genetic pathway. It isn't just a little on or off switch, you know, with one single gene or one single chromosome handling it. Everybody watching this has the genes for both testes and ovaries, has the, 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 the ability to develop either one of these ways. Um, Talk about the Y chromosome uh, being something that is exclusive and, 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 and females don't have it. Well, yeah, there's Sawyer syndrome, actually. And there are case studies of women, of, of female humans. I'm going to leave the word women to the side for a second. Of female humans with XY allosomes. They have a, a Y chromosome there. Uh, and they also have gotten pregnant and given birth to healthy children. 
So if we're going to say the Y chromosome is the indicator, then you have to say that these are men, or I should say males. Um, and you get, you hear me catching myself over and over here where I distinguish between male and man, woman and female, and that's because sex and gender are completely different things. Um, and that's important also to point out because what you brought up here was you were talking to your friend about trans people, and you fell on the topic of, of these different chromosomal configurations. That's to do with intersex people. Intersex people and trans people aren't necessarily, these are not, you know, not always the same thing. Some, sometimes they overlap, but they're completely different groups that have completely different issues and completely different things to talk about and completely different struggles um, that sometimes line up and sometimes don't. And because so many people conflate sex and gender together, oftentimes that's what becomes the argument is like, oh, well, this statistically small number of people have Kleinfelter syndrome, therefore, I don't have to care about trans people. And I'm like, well, now you're just wrong twice. That's that's two <laughs> bad arguments at the same time. Yeah. So yeah, it, the, the, the simple fact of the matter is, um, as far as I can tell in, in, in my learning of this and, and with all my, my friends, um, is that these are grouping terms that we use in biology to define patterns. Uh, but just like with any other pattern ever, and as Christy just pointed out a minute ago, we're coming to this reckoning where we're realizing that there was a bit of a mistake here, that we left a lot of shit out. We glossed over a lot of important details in order to help us fit a, a, a norm that we had that was easy to understand. And there's a lot of great papers out there that talk about this, that like this, this binary that we've reinforced is it makes it very easy to write a scientific paper and it makes it very easy to understand the big picture. But when you're dealing with actual reality of actual people, it doesn't really work all the time. And that's not unique in science whatsoever. I mentioned earlier about biological anthropology and how we used to use science poorly to reinforce sexist and racist ideas of the 18th and 19th century. And then we had a reckoning and we realized that didn't work anymore. And we completely reformatted an entire field of science to make it work properly and to help us understand something about human beings. We're at the exact same point now with biology, which isn't a new place to be. We've been here a million times. The history of science as a whole, especially biology, is finding out some new shit that causes us to challenge our worldview and tear apart all of our notions of what reality is. And we are here now with sex and gender, where we're learning a lot of new stuff, which is actually like 50 year old information that we're kind of now coming to terms with. And we're changing some ideas and we're changing some models. And that's not a scary thing. And it's no excuse to be a hateful, homophobic, transphobic asshole. Steve, how does all that sit with you? Uh, I absolutely agree. I got two new syndromes I didn't know about. So uh, now even if I get this poor genetic argument, I can show examples that that it, it is not always the case and we have to see a broader picture because I don't want to fall into this trap where both my friend and I, we are both around 40 and nobody of us has studied biology. We just got our college degrees, sure. our high school mm -hmm. degrees and um, that's why I'm always learning. That's why I especially wanted to, to talk to Forrest. So thank you very much, all of you. Yeah, and, um, and you know, Forrest yeah. touched on the distinction between sex and gender, but before I let you go, I feel like it's important to point out, yeah. at least on some level, that we can be somewhat uh, descriptive when we're talking about uh, genetics, when we're talking about phenotypes, when some of these different pieces... None of that is even getting into the conversation of the way things should be. And when we tell people how they ought to dress or how they ought to appear and sort of the philosophy of freedom of choice and, and some of these other big questions, I appreciate that you are making an effort to try and understand some of these underlying issues. But I hope also that as we apply it, we don't become prescriptive. Even if we could run the test, even if we could say genetically, scientifically, in whatever way, you are an X, that we wouldn't, you know, look down our noses at people and wag our fingers at them and tell them, therefore, you must be how I say that is. Yeah, it that's, that's true. Yeah. Team just with a new color. Sure. Yeah. It's just a, a way of understanding one another. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, uh, thank you very much, um, I, uh, Christy. Uh, I know about the, the uh, difference uh, between sex and gender, and I always try to, to make this distinction. And we were absolutely just talking. We agreed on just talking on the physical level of, of genetics sure. and um, to get a starting point uh, where we are in our uh, discussion, uh, my friend and I, and where do we want to see uh, society grow? Mm. Because he, he also made the, in my opinion, silly argument about uh, women or trans women in male sports like USC and uh, and all those those uh, bullshit arguments, in my opinion, <laughs> sure, because he yeah. doesn't even care about the sports. He's just about. Right. It is no strange woman. how just very concerned we've all suddenly gotten about the competitiveness <laughs> of uh, of women's sports. It's kind of like right. how we all got worked up about the ethics in gaming journalism a couple of years ago. Uh, at the root of so many of these things, it's our good old fashioned friend misogyny. Uh, mm. But Steve, thank you so yeah. much for uh, for giving us a call today. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Hey, you take care. Half the people talking about what should or shouldn't happen in women's sports today have never watched a single game of any women's sport. Fair to say. Now, yeah. Now, because they feel some type of way, they've got some type of opinion, and they've found some mm -hmm. words online to try and prove that they are already right without having critically examined it. Mm-hmm. Human. Never missed an opportunity. <laughs> To blend homophobia and tra uh, homophobia and sexism into the diarrhea martini of transphobia. Mm -hmm. I was I'm pleasantly surprised by by that call because I saw it on the screen. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck, <laughs> what are we gonna have to talk about? I <laughs> I was prepared. I always like to point out I have I've got at all times when I do these shows here from my office, uh, live from Oklahoma. Uh, I've got five different textbooks within reach about the difference of sex and gender and like and bio textbooks they because people are like oh well you know anthropology isn't science so like okay here's genetics have fun with that <laughs> tell me yeah. how much it's not science yeah i don't want to get too far from the calls or uh, too deep into our own navels but we we kind of talked a little bit earlier about how people can get upset about the idea of infinity and how mm -hmm. significant that can be in their lives and i i do think that it's very interesting that this is a topic this is an issue where people yeah. do like to get very up in arms I, uh, I, I went to a private Christian high school, uh, and we were told, we were taught that the question of evolution was the most important, the most significant issue of our age. Because if you could prove that humans were just like every other animal, we lost our soul, we lost our spirit, then the importance of God and religion would completely diminish from lives. And I, I think that as we begin to understand the non-binary nature of human sexuality and gender and these things, we start to pull apart this, you know, male and female, he made them kind of mindset. And it, it's worth pointing out that it is very destructive to, I think, not just the common cultural worldview of Christianity, but really what is like textual and maybe a necessary doctrine. Uh, am I overthinking it or does that line up for the two of you? That that lines up pretty well. Um, I, I, also, in the back of my mind, I'm like, man, I'm so glad that uh, there's there's a couple particular points in my life where I'm like, you know what? If they'd just been slightly better at recruiting at this, or slightly oh, better sure. at recruiting at that, yeah. I would have been a Christian. And immediately, I'm like, oh, well, it's super easy to form a the type of apologetic that people give was, oh, no, 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 humans evolved naturally. And then when they were human enough and perfectly in the image of God, then the soul Then they got a soul. Uh. <laughs> Whatever. Which, I, I mean, I, you, no one has ever accused Christian apologists of being creative or innovative. But there, there you go. Make that also fallacious argument where you have no evidence, but it's me. At least it will be more interesting than having the same arguments over and over again. Think of something new, please. Sure. Um, but secondly... Are people really upset about the idea of infinity? Is that a thing? Did I miss this this rage on the internet? No, there's only so many numbers. It yeah, stops after uh, well, a million. I mean, not necessarily yeah. the notion of infinity existing, but there is something about the kind of existential void of it all that I, I do think can kind of suck people in. People can get very uncomfortable about around some of these topics, around some of these notions. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I think it's, it's important. I'm just very comfortable with everything, but I've no. I've mm -hmm. what? 
Yeah, also, no, it, uh, that's the yeah. thing is you, you know, people like, you know, it, to, to, to use this language, people like us, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. We, uh, All right, here we, we go. tend to, to uh, I don't know, I, I think that we, uh, the three of us specifically, um, tend to be a lot more open to, to suggestion and to new evidence and to thinking about these things. And I think that's indicative of especially the atheist community. I don't know why I'm full screen right now. Um, but uh, the, 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 we, this is something that's supposed to be indicative of atheists in general is that we are critical thinkers and that we're, we're going to go out and challenge the norm a little bit. And we're going to, you know, take what we we've learned in school and we've learned all our lives and be willing to break it apart. And that's why it's really disappointing when so many people in the atheist community specifically will come into the chat here or into the, the comment section. I guarantee in the comment section of this video, we're going to leave at least person, one person saying, I thought this show was about atheism and now it's the new religion of woke and all these things. And it's like, why are you not willing to adapt to new information on these things? The mm -hmm. same way you were willing to challenge your old heuristics in your religion, the way you the same way you were willing to adapt to new information. Then, um, we we see so many people. I, I got accused one time. I was I talked about the textbooks. I brought out the textbooks in a discussion once, and somebody told me that the textbooks were too new, and that means they're wrong. And it's <laughs> like, how the fuck Whoa. are you going to tell me that like it, it that there's this global conspiracy of scientists that are trying to challenge your worldview, your your strange parochial you know. Uh, a little gender norms that you have and they're doing all this amazing research and coming up with all these new ideas and having these big debates just to, for what so just that you might you. consider putting on nail polish someday what like, what's so the, point? the big textbook can sell more science is what it is <laughs> that's yeah, what it that's is what it that's really comes down to science all right say, the only scientists that are interested in the way that you talk are anthropologists and they're interested for a different reason <laughs> right. uh, linguistics yeah. Lingu that's why yes. i'm not a linguist uh, yeah. Well, we've got a few more callers on the line. We mm -hmm. do still have some lines open, but uh, mm -hmm. let's hit a, a couple of super chats before we do. Uh, uh, Jamie, can I uh, pass these off to you? Um, yes. I don't know if there's a standard format for this, but Alan Ferguson sent in a super chat uh, with some complimentary things. What a terrific trio starting us off today. I was going to say, you sound like me if your day starts at 1 p.m. Starting us off today, <laughs> I'll probably want to go argue with a theist, misogynist, transphobe, slash etc by the time this is over great show and i'd say hey do so at your own risk um <laughs> <laughs> if you've got the patience for a discussion like that go for it we've also got uh, miranda rensberger who just said thanks for all the science talk today yes it's the most science talk i've engaged in this week and that's a shortcoming i'll hopefully uh you know, engage in, I, I don't know where to go textbook shopping, and I'm not in school <laughs> at the moment, but pretty much anything you send in, as long as it's an actual textbook, will expand my library and I'll enjoy it. Dropping that just in the middle of the show. Um, and then we've got a third super chat from Ben Nine Lives, meow meow, that's what I say, um, who says, thanks for putting on the show, always look forward to Sundays without boring worship of the invisible man. Hey, yeah, I, I tell you what, I'd, I'd rather worship a man I can see. I'm right there with you, Ben. Okay. And thank you to everyone in the chat. Not everyone's dropping the them coins, but uh, everyone's participating. Yeah. Well, let's jump in with uh, Scotty in Florida, who has some questions about the creation of the Bible. Uh, Scotty, what can uh, what can we help you with today? Okay. Uh, a question that I, I, I've had since I was nine years old when I was going to get uh, baptized, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was worried at nine years old that you know they had me believing you know you know pick the wrong religion you you know you go to hell. So I didn't want to pick the wrong religion, so I wanted to talk to the minister about the religion, and he had. Sure. I had a bunch of questions that he couldn't answer and I didn't get baptized. My brother got baptized. My family gave me a hard time about it. But from that moment on, I wanted to find out what's the truth. So I spent my whole life in archaeological digs and libraries and stuff all over the world, trying to find out the stuff and learning Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and stuff, trying to find out the truth. Well, the one question that I don't hear you guys ask these people that say Jesus is God and this is the thing that drove me crazy and still drives me crazy to this day is is uh 
God gave uh, Adam and Eve the law orally. Then he gave it to Moses written because they couldn't follow it by oral. Then he gave it written. They couldn't follow it by the written law. So then he set down the example himself. Uh, supposedly, I'm talking in the theater of uh, Christi- Christian uh, Judaism. Um, but anyway, he gave the example. And they say that he's God, even though he never said that. They say he's God. All right. Well, if he was God... Why didn't he, and he knows all the languages, he knows all the mm-hmm. stuff, he knows everything. Why didn't he write the Bible then instead yeah. of waiting for somebody who didn't even know him, didn't even talk yeah. to him 300 years later to write the canonized Bible, which is not, wasn't even t- truly canonized until after the Jews canonized their uh, Old Testament. Yeah, so yeah. You've got 66 is, uh, different book books all cobbled yeah. together at the Council right. of Nicaea. Like, I, I mean, this this is really central for me. We have people call in all the time and say, you know, uh, my entire house burned down, but not the family Bible. Or uh, because God predicted that there would be uh, seven days in the calendar week, therefore Jesus is in charge. Or the shroud of turn, like all of these different things that supposedly point to the existence of God, but they really make me just want to shake and ask if there truly is this all-powerful, loving being who desperately wants me to know him, why is his mechanism of communication so shitty? Why is it this, like, ancient Semitic poetry that we're having to rely on instead of some other form of connection? I, you know, Scotty, it feels like one of those questions where the answer is too obvious to be the real answer, but I, I think we kind of just have to go with, exactly. well, it, it's because it's all been sort of sorted out post hoc. God yeah. didn't write the Bible when he was here on earth because there, there, there is no God and he, he was never yeah. here on earth. I, I think we, we kind of have to leave it there. Is there more or, that y'all can maybe add or, to that? Yeah. Or the Amish have it right. And God is also Amish and doesn't want to use a cell phone and show up and tell everybody <laughs> that he's here. That's what it is. He only has the book. He's limited by the technology he of his time. works in mysterious yeah. ways. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. I think it's sort of like yeah. saying, well, well that's why the did... That always got me. Yeah. Why, why did the uh, Millennium... Why did he say the Millennium Falcon finish the race uh, in parsecs rather than in time? It's sort of one of these things that you have <laughs> right, to exactly. retrospectively correct. Uh, I mean, anything... You know, you, anytime you see something like that, it's yeah. because a wizard did it. Well, mm. I, I... Magic, obviously. You know. Right. Those right. were all... Uh, I believe there is a power, but I, I believe the power is... is uh, there's a scientific explanation, and religion has tried to just well, if we can't figure out the scientific explanation. We just say it's a god. So mm-hmm. I believe there is some kind of force that spreads life through the universe, or at least this galaxy. And you know, but it's a force. It's not some person sitting in a chair with long hair and a beard, you know, granting wishes and and handing out you know uh, blessings and stuff. So I'd go but, beyond uh, that. And I say, believe it. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, it's more you. like gravity or time you know yeah or quite uh, a few of those things i'd say that the same uh forces that ended up creating our sun ended up creating what we now call consciousness if we can call anything consciousness it's a a Mm. series of events that affected space time and matter and muons and all of it that has yielded this particular result right the same reason that Pluto is cold right. is the same reason that it's too damn hot in the summer. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, exactly. It's the, yeah, it's the same right. series of forces, and hopefully we don't get wiped out by a random giant wave of gamma radiation ripping through the solar system. Exactly. Although there's good exactly. reason to believe that we're not likely to be wiped out by a giant wave of gamma radiation ripping through our solar system. I checked the other day. So, um, yeah. Did you? Yeah, well, there's I've not... There's these not nihilistic a, bedtime yeah, stories yeah. just yeah. warm my like, heart well, and soul. There, there isn't a, 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 an exploding quasar within 300 light years of where we are. So it's unlikely right. that we're going to die now. <laughs> um, not, 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 wouldn't not, it have not, been not, crazy not, if we'd actually died right then, you guys? Say, wouldn't yeah, that have been yeah, so wild? But none of you would have been around <laughs> to tell me I was wrong. So, ha it's like a, it's like a mentalist. Yeah, that James speak. Telescope has really opened up a lot of things to us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, Scotty, I, I wish I had a, a more sophisticated answer than you know. God didn't write the Bible when He was on Earth because 
God there is no God, Bible. and God didn't write the Bible, and he wasn't here on earth. But I, I feel like that's ultimately what it kind of comes down to. Uh, how, how does that land for you? Is there anything missing or anything else that you want to mention before we move on to our last couple of calls? Yeah, uh, I would kind of like to mention one thing is that uh, the canonized Bible is missing tons of sacred scriptures. Oh, no, biblical yes. apocrypha. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, this, right. those are some of my it's, favorite ghost stories, it, really. Say, and then actually, um, Scotty, right. have then, you read uh, the book Lost Christianities by Bart Ehrman? If you're, if you're interested in the, the Apocrypha and all of that, it goes back to the early Christian church, like particularly in the first couple hundred years before there was right. Orthodox and non-Orthodox. That's where I go, yeah. Oh, so you, right. you've read, right. you've read some early. That's where I go, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. 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 That was, and that, my thing is, is it's, Constantine put this thing together, the Canine's Bible, mm -hmm. and to me it's Satan's Bible because it's so full of confusion. And who, now I'm mm -hmm. talking in, the, in their theater, not, not in the <laughs> sure, theater, sure. but mm -hmm. in their theater. Uh, in their theater, to me, Satan wrote that Bible because it's full of confusion. And who's the author of confusion? Satan. So it couldn't be wrote by God or, or inspired by God. And the thing is, I describe it as this: is it, it's a great tapestry. From a distance, it looks beautiful, but when you get close, you start to find little evil pictures inside of it that are nasty and don't conform to what with the tapestry appears to look like. So to me, it's uh, uh, it was a way to control people, and they brought in tides so they could pay me so I can control you so you can go to heaven and you be a good person in my in my kingdom, Constantine's mm -hmm. kingdom. Yeah. So it's funny that you mentioned I'll, that because like that's something that I've put out as a thought experiment a couple of times when people talk about God versus Satan and confusion and all these things. I love pointing out like if I was Satan. If I was in charge, you know, if, if I was actually the big, bad, evil guy in this universe, number one, I would want to make sure that everybody believed in me. I'd want them to think they were getting the upper hand by believing me. I, I would spread things like the greatest lie that the devil or I agreed, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was telling people he didn't exist. So that way, everybody thinks that they're winning by believing in me. I want everybody <laughs> to believe in me. And then the second thing I want is for everybody to believe that I'm God and that God is me. And I would put out a book full of homophobia and hatred and racism and genocide and misogyny and all sorts of bullshit that's confusing and nonsensical and it endorses slavery at one point but there's this other part where it kind of doesn't so people can argue about that they could be you i would make it the most confusing shit in the world and i would make sure to tell everybody that everybody who talks about gender equality and sexual equality and 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 and, and uh, you know equality of religion and of belief and uh, of working together as one community those are all the satanists those are the sinners those are the bad guys remember you guys don't like satan i'm telling you the, all the people who want equality those are the evil people you should be doing the thing in the book that says that it's good i'll be doing the same shit man um and i that said is that the most compelling argument for uh for the bible i have ever heard i'm actually yeah. Starting to rethink. I've been waiting for evidence all these years. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Well, keep, and I keep for sure me, but keep going. I would, oh, I'd make it as difficult as possible. And I put, <laughs> I said that on a show. I think it was here once. It was on, I was on AXP or on Talk Ethan once. I, I gave that thought experiment. Uh, and somebody emailed me through my ACA email and was like, Forrest uh, uh, talked about how Satan compared Satan with God and suggested that God might be Satan. But in Matthew chapter whatever, it says that blasphemy is a sin. And so you should really rethink that because you're going to go to hell. And I was like, what? What is, what, what's the thought process here on sending me this? It sounds like you well, do you not know, consider my problem. Got me is at the end of the Bible, it says, uh, uh, and nobody should change any word in this or they have all the curses. And my thought, even as a child, I thought, well, that's the perfect thing to put in there to make sure nobody changes your word, you know. Right. But something else I like for you to think about is Jesus said he came for the Jew. He did not say he came for the Gentile. Paul said, made it for the Gentile. And I could, if a as a prosecutor, I could prosecute Paul as being an antichrist with a certain uh, Satanist religion and uh, Constantine helping him forward out. But also the cross, when it's laid down on his side, used to be a Hebrew symbol for Satan. The cross laying down on its side, uh, it was, and they threw it out of the alphabet because it was so so uh, so scary for him, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, Scott, it's like you said, it's all about who gets to decide what's canon. 
You know, it, it always right. comes down to, to like who get, who gets to actually yes. write the book and uh, and put it all together and in, enforce but believe says, it don't or be destroyed. He said, don't erect. No. Yeah. All right. He Whether that ideology is religious or images or and worship them, and all the, all the Christian uh, religions have erected that cross that laid on the side have now erected it and put it in their churches. So there's even more proof that it's a Satanist religion when God says don't erect any graven images and worship them, and then the Christians erect the uh, symbol for Satan, erect it straight up, and then they put it in all the churches. Hey, there's and plenty of think, exception you, finding. There's a lot yeah. to, to pick apart. Yeah. And what but, do you think uh, Jesus, who said, you know, give every, sell everything you have and give everything to the poor and get rid of all your clothes and just wear rags and just live as, po as impoverished as you possibly can to make sure that your fellow man around you are taken care of and feed the hungry and clothe the naked and and and, and you know care for the right. sick and, and the dying what do you think he would think of the mountains of gold hoarded in all these churches these sure. massive you know uh, 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 you know uh, what do you call it uh, 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 frescoes and, and 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 murals and arts and painting and all these ridiculous exorbitant displays of wealth that could cure world hunger overnight I'm sure he would love it. <laughs> not, just, not just hoarded inside. There's yeah. literally giant gold palaces. And then even yes. taking a step back yeah. from the, the details of a particular religion, I feel like in the same way that uh, astronomers have been able to figure out, oh, these are the stages of how a star forms. This is what the beginning and the middle and the end of the life cycle of this particular star is. I think that in the modern era, we've witnessed the birth of religions and we've seen ones in uh, later and more evolved forms, right? The Church mm -hmm. of Scientology is very new and we saw how it formed and it formed around a single person that was a cult leader. And it's not the only one we've seen formed recently, and right. it's not the only cult we've seen formed recently. Some of them expand and become giants. Some of them die when they're small. Some of them implode. Some of them evolve in various ways, but they all share characteristics of being an in-group, out-group following of basically a cult leader type figure. So when people mention to me, what do you think Jesus was like? What do you think Jesus was like? What do you think Jesus was like? I think that he and L. Ron Hubbard probably had quite a lot in common. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, fair to say. <laughs> well, Scotty, we've got an apology read. for you. Hey, we've got a bunch of people who have been waiting on the lines that I'd love to okay. speak to before the uh, end of our show. But, Scotty, I, I very much appreciate your time. All right. I appreciate you putting me on. Bless you guys. Hey, y'all have a great day. Hey, mm -hmm. thank you so much. All right, I'm going to let you two argue over who should go to next. Uh, first, I'm going to point out, though, that Roger Wenzel gave us another super chat. Uh, knowledge of how sausage, laws, and holy books are made destroys one re one's respect for each, which uh, I think is uh, rather astute considering the conversation that we're having. Lovely. Where do you all want to go next? I'd say either number one, then number nine, or number nine, and then uh, the other two. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I was going to read, by the way, the reason I had a book in my hand, what Jamie was talking about reminded me of James Joyce, uh, the mysterious universe where he talks about like, you know, what kind of universe are we in? It's one that clearly doesn't care about life. And it, it kind of describes just the naturalistic explanations for life and how they seem so improbable, but they're really not when you think about them. Really cool yeah. shit. It's a, it's a universe that seems to favor the creation of black holes mm. yeah. more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, from the beginning with the potential existence of black hole stars, which I learned about the other day and are super cool. Except they That's my a, Google for uh, for yeah, after the show. Ex <laughs> except in a deadly, destructing, every Terrifying way. Yeah, in, a, in a terrifying, holy... Sh I'm glad there's none of these near me, but wow, from a distance. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's really cool to look at way over way there. Way over there. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's let's, let's talk do. to Shane in Nebraska, uh, who's been waiting very patiently for quite a while now. Shane, uh, walk us through your ideas here. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, yeah. Anyways, um, I, I think... I'm writing a book, and the reasons are only relevant as uh, I grew up life as a hard charging Christian and then had a uh, four year period where some uh, interesting things happened and uh, loved me uh, uh, between an atheist and an existential nihilist. Um, truth or not, uh, that one could say about Christianity, um, especially in uh, evangelical, you know, fundamentalist is that uh, it may not be true, but the worldview is nuanced. And 
as I was forced to uh, understand reality, uh, I, I found what I believe is to be a nuanced interpretation where one can drive a moral basis from a naturalistic philosophy. That's true. I think the the objection that I mean, if you're if you're talking about how uh, a theist might respond to that, their response is always the same. It's always, "Well, you don't have the Bible," and basically, that is sort of the difference and the only difference between a theistic uh, a view and a non theistic view of the basis of morality is that one of them begins with a holy book and then tries to evaluate what is good or bad based on some stuff from that. And a non-theistic view tries to determine what is good or what is bad based on what we can observe in reality rather than an ancient story that someone that we don't know was told. I, um, I think it's possible even though to get away from ideas of quote good and bad and simply look at well what is the thing that we are trying to increase. You know, if we want to think about morality as the well-being of conscious creatures, then the thing that we are increasing or decreasing is simply well-being. And whether that's a, quote, good thing or bad thing is kind of in the eye of the beholder again. Yeah, it's, a, it's an evaluative yeah, statement. No, no, and so yeah. I can evaluate which basket has more apples in it. But uh, evaluating which... Is that a good is thing or a bad thing? Is it a good thing or a bad thing is... Uh, Ultimately, it comes down to the roots that people uh, not even rely on, but that drive people's desire to define good and evil are products of what we are as a species, and that's a social species. Wolves have morality as well. When people say, oh, our morality comes from the Bible, I want to ask them, where does a wolf's morality come from? Because we've observed that. Where does a chimpanzee's morality come from? Because we've observed moral behavior in these things. So I know that we have a more sophisticated set of language and uh, we're greater uh, social beings. I think Forrest will hopefully back me up on that if I didn't get that wrong. I have a, our more social uh, primate species. It comes down to the same thing. And so, I mean, uh, it says here that you wanted to check your thesis on objective naturalistic reality. I'm wondering what role the word objective in that label plays because, sure, we can have arguments about human beings have values that fall into a sense of what is or isn't fair, but the conclusions about specifically, is this instance fair, is that instance fair? Is it fair for them to split the reward down the middle? If there's three cookies and they can't be split to be given to two people that did the work and two of them did exactly the same work, is it fair for one to be rewarded more than the other for no reason but chance? Right? And some societies would say yes, some societies would say no. And when they do psychological studies with children, there's often times where children say the third cookie should be destroyed because it would be unfair for one person to have it more. There'd be societies that would say, okay, we'll flip a coin at the end and someone will be rewarded more by chance. And there's societies that would probably say, and people that would probably say, no, that's even, even more vicious because the purpose of morality and the purpose of order is to create a society that people can feel a part of. And how can you feel a part of something where your neighbor wins and you don't? And so you can say that there's, okay. I would say there's um, something about that you could say somewhat objective in terms of how much it can be observed in terms of people caring about fairness, but the conclusions from it are, are different and cultural and... Uh, less objective. So I'm wondering, anyway, now that I've, I've asked a question and talked about it for a minute, I'm wondering what role the word objective plays in your thesis. I guess I, I'm talking about an underlying thesis for why we can draw moral behaviors from, right? Okay. And so I rest, at least I try to approach it from resting on three premises. First, that logic is the best way we have found to move from a correlation from assumption to uh, uh, and an effect. The second is that so far the scientific method has been the mess, most of, best method we have found to codify what objective reality and how it manifests for a subjective person. My third assumption is that generally speaking, it is better not to suffer than to suffer. So. The question arises, is that absence and outside objective uh, you know, point of view, how do we determine who we are and what is good and bad? And so to that end, I look at our uh, genetic cousins, right? Chimps and bonobos share 99.6% of their DNA with each other. 
They also share equally 98.7% of their data with us. Uh, for us, please check me. But when we That's look at those enough. societies, right, and, and again, okay, thank you. Um, and again, you gentlemen are, are, are painting with point brushes while I am uh, painting with a very broad roller. So, um, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, so uh, chimps are uh, notably patriarchal. Um, they patrol their boundaries and, and again, I'm sorry, these are generalities, but they patrol their, the, the, the edges of their you know, troops territory. Um, they're not exactly welcoming to outsiders. Uh, mate selection is chosen on the basis of, you know, hierarchical uh, status within the, the troop. Um, we, we take after chimps because back in the stone age, it made sense to focus on the individual over the group. But nobles, on the other hand, uh, are matriarchal, generally speaking, and uh, they're more welcoming to outsiders. They're you know more inclusive in the way that they interact. Um, as Forrest has said a number of times, they really like sex. Um, one of my favorite facts about bonobos is that when the troop discovers a new food for, food source, and they are in the inter, excuse me, in order to push back on food aggression, they have an orgy. Because when one has a wax in oxytocin, they don't tend to feel, you know, aggressive. So are these assumptions, do they make sense? And then if so, I can draw a conclusion based on that. Well, I mean, are, are you saying that uh, we take after chimpanzees, but we do not take after bonobos? And are we starting to get into that territory that Jamie was describing earlier, where you say, like, well, men are this, or men can be that, when we talk about bonobos, and we talk about chimpanzees, and we talk about humans? Because th this is all feeling, like, very, very broad and, and uh generalized and vague to the point where I actually do have it feel a little uncomfortable like uh, attaching to any of these premises yeah it, it, what, what gets me about it is I understand the way you said we take after chimps um, the way I would describe your premise there um, is to say that that kind of patriarchy um, and, and aggressive behavior and all those things are ancestral traits they're things that have been around for a long time. They were with our common ancestor with chimps and all that. They came out and then the kind of lovey-dovey, you know, uh, uh, matriarchal sex-based society that we see in bonobos is a derived trait. It's a new thing that came up just with their branches, an apomorphy, um, whereas all these other things are synapomorphic. They're, they're things that connect this whole family tree, including our common ancestor. Um, and I don't think that's accurate. I can see where you could make that argument, but like, no, no, nor do I, I think nor do I. I, I, I didn't say everything clearly. Okay, maybe I misunderstood then. No, no, I'm sorry. So, okay, so given those, you know, three presumptions or three assumptions and one observation, then if we look at the bonobos and chimps, right, they're not pack animals like dogs, nor are they like cats who are solitary animals, but rather the social creatures. So then if one is going to figure out what's the best, one will look, will look from perspective of a pro-social to anti-social, or to pro-social to individual perspective. In this... I, I think we can... I'm sorry to interrupt. I just I feel like we have to abandon that word, the best. I, I, I don't know that we can get terribly far in our understanding of uh, human or animal behavior when we are wrapped up in these notions of correct and incorrect. I, that's maybe what I was trying to assert at the very beginning of this conversation. We can talk about what might lead to the greatest amount of well-being, and I think that that's a very valuable goal. We can talk about a lot of other goals as well, but that notion no, 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 of yeah, good, right, bad, right. right, wrong, evil, correct, incorrect, it just just is too limiting for me. I, I, I apologize if I've taken us down the wrong path. Uh, please continue with what you were saying. I just wanted to bear that in mind. Thank you. I, I apologize for not making this clear. If, if then the, the goal of humans is to interact in soci society, then what is best for humanity will generally be best, for, that will be that which is best for the group, right? Because in, in diversity, we, we derive strength. And sure. so uh, a perspective on life, which is pro-social, 
will tend to produce actions which are helpful to the group and then implicitly helpful to the individual. So drawing it back to our, our very, very broad uh, analogy versus a chimp versus bonobo, right? Once we you know achieve diversification of labor, then pro-group was thinking is preferred over you know that which is pro-individual. And as such, it is the bottom of bonobos that it seems that would be preferred for humans to adopt because at that point then human potential becomes realized. And as to what is the good for a person or I would say even a session entity, it is simply to expand and explore the niche in which one finds itself. Yeah, and I, I think that to a larger extent I can agree with you that humans should adopt a more pro-orgy response to stressful situations like the bonobo. Um, I'm in favor. I don't know when we're less violence, the more orgies. Yeah, yes, less broadly violence, speaking. Yeah, yeah. There's a there was a comment in the uh, uh, chat as well that was orgies, orgies. We want more orgies. Um, that was pretty good. Uh, but uh, I I think that broadly I agree with you. Your your beginning steps towards morality echo some of mine actually. So I I can uh, try and agree with you. They're they're a little bit different in terms of the specific selection, but for me my view also includes. The fact that, sure, I'm in a sense an individual in a species, but I'm also, uh, as best I can define, a type of wave through matter in an expanding universe. And uh, ultimately, I mean, I'll, I'll very not humbly propose that the one goal that would be the purpose of a species that's highly social and can use tools and communicate well would be to save the universe from its ultimate heat death. We've got hundreds of millions of years and the technology that we've developed only in the past two centuries should at least inspire your inspiration beyond what we can in, uh, imagine at the present moment. If you ask someone in the 1800s, if you ask someone in 1776, um, hey, what do you think uh, the world's going to look like in two years? They wouldn't tell you about electricity and the internet. And they certainly wouldn't tell you about human rights <clears throat> um, and how far we've come in, in that regard. And so, yeah, in a certain sense, having a more pro-social uh, stance is something that I can say uh, is is beneficial just on the same principles. And so I think we're largely in agreement there. And I think uh, we've done a pretty good job of... Uh, checking your, your thesis on a naturalistic reality, and I did encourage you to continue wondering, but we, we've said a lot here, uh, how does all of that sit with you, to steal Christie's line? Because um, I think we've got a couple more calls and we're, uh, we're running over time. Sure, no, I, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. What I, I was hoping to address is that, assuming what I've said is to be true, assuming my conclusion is more accurate than not to be, you know, true, then what does that just mean about in terms of the human condition? Which, again, will we'll take some time to go into. Yeah, well, so the, so the, the, move on the that, type of conclusion you draw from that would be largely one of sentiment. There's people that examine where humanity is and feel despair, and there's people like me that examine where humanity is or, or how humanity is and goes, oh, well, now with a greater framework and a greater understanding, it's possible to more accurately and to a greater extent affect where we are. And so knowledge, even if it's unpopular, is something that brings a level of, in some sense, power and control. And that can be misused, but it can also be used to produce a better condition. Fewer people die uh, of well, I was about to say fewer people die of natural causes, but there's more people now. We have a better handle on disease than we did 200 years ago. And for that, I'm grateful. I think we're going to have to go on to our next caller, Shane. But it's certainly an interesting question. And I know that we've got, I think we've still got a Discord channel, although we haven't plugged it uh, yet, unless things have changed radically around here. Um, uh, but th thank you for calling in. Yeah, it, the, again, that's fine. I, I was hoping to get your opinion on the conclusions drawn from that, but uh, that's not a problem. So, um, yeah, have a wonderful day. Yeah, hit us at tv at atheist-community.org. Uh, there are a number of ways to stay in touch to keep this conversation going in the uh, uh, fan run, talk heathen fan group on Facebook. Uh, we, we'd love to hear more. Uh, but, you know, as Jamie said, we are getting a little bit long. So let's take this uh, this final call from Jacob in Utah. Uh, Jacob, looking at deconstructing your religion. Uh, talk to us about what's going on right now. Hi. 
so, well, first off, thank you for taking my call. I know we're running on time. And second of all, I'll, uh, Forrest, thank you so much. You've helped me along my journey of deconstructing. Thank but you. I, when it comes to the deconstruction, people are asking me, like, oh, why aren't you a Christian anymore? Why don't you believe? Which I can answer fine and well enough. You know, I believe in truth and stuff. But also, I, I'm full disclosure, I'm, I'm ex-Mormon, ex-LDS, whatever you want to call it. Mm. And that religion is obsessed with the idea that they are the right religion out of all the other religions, right? Sure. I, I don't know if that's unique to them. I'm sure a lot You're of religions are like one. that. Yeah. But I always... Yeah, I always get this question of, hey, why did you leave our church? Why did you leave this church? And I'm having a really hard time explaining it and judging it because I'm like, okay, I used to be a net result guy. I'm like, hey, you know what? Net result, the people are are doing a lot of stuff I don't like under the name of God, and that's not cool. And then they say, well, the people isn't the church. I'm like, okay, well, then what is the church? Is, is it its teachings? And its teachings aren't like super terrible as far as I know, but it has the result of the people. So how do you judge its teachings if the people are, you know, doing terrible stuff in the name of the teachings? And they're like, oh, well, then it's just back to the people. I'm like, okay, so if it's not the teachings, not the, te- the people, what if it's like the leaders? And it's like, well, it's only what the leaders teach from the pulpit, though. I'm like, then we're back in this circle I keep going round and round, and I can't sure. get out of that. I, I, I appreciate yeah. that uh, that sort of net results framework that you're approaching it from. Uh, the whole, uh, you know, by their fruits they will be known kind of mentality. And there's value in, in looking at all of that. Uh, but I, I've i been actually really shocked uh, as a therapist, the number of people that I have worked with who have sort of approached this like pros, cons list attitude of, well, if I believe then this, this, and this, and I get these nice little benefits, but I suffer these little consequences. And if I don't believe, then I, I have these pros and I have these cons and trying to decide to believe or to not believe believe. And for me, it all has to be sort of underlined by the question of, is it true? Is it real? You know, I mean, is uh, Christianity a good thing for the world or a bad thing for the world? That is a question. It's an important question, but it's a very different question from the one of, is Christianity, is Mormonism, are any of these belief systems genuine? Are they based on truth? Are they based on reality? And I, I might challenge you to incorporate that in your calculations here, yeah? Meaning, uh, sorry, I'm just wrapping my head around everything. Meaning that the, so taking a step back from all that, just saying, hey, is it true at all? is what you're saying, is that? Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. never mind what the results or the consequences of these teachings are. I mean, not never mind them for long, because that shit matters. But before we even get to that, are these things that people are say, are writing in their holy books? Are these hymns that we are singing, these lectures that we are giving, these sermons from these pulpits, are they factual? Are they rational? Are they grounded in reality? Are they evidence-based on any sort of level? Those are not inconsequential questions, and they're ones that our society, specifically around the subject of religion, often sort of fast-forwards through as if it's almost beside the point. We talk about religions of peace and religions that are warlike and religions that are this and religions that are that, and we sort of forget to even stop and ask, well, are these religions real because when it comes to choosing a religion it's almost like choosing a fandom and fictional and we don't even really bother with the the historicity or or just the veracity of these ideas is that is that a fair critique do you guys think so yeah absolutely and i think it in some ways it's true it's he's he's asking how do i tell whether a church is good or bad and i'd say that i don't think you can classify a group of people or a social movement or an organization as simply as that, particularly one with hundreds of years of history. But you can look at, like uh, Christie said, the truth value, especially of the metaphysical claims of a religion, 
right, and uh, compare that to reality. So you can point to, as, as many uh, believers and people that belong to churches, oh, but my church does so much charity, my church is good. Why are you, why are you trying to take grandma's cookies away from me on Sunday? Isn't my religion excellent? Well, it's important to remember that the things that humans do here on earth, humans can do whether they pray to Jesus or Muhammad or whether we don't pray at all. My mom bakes cookies as well, and it's got nothing to do with Jesus. Um, although I, perhaps she'll claim otherwise because she still attends church and is very active. I can bake cookies. They may not be as good, but it's not because I don't go to, it's to about church. It's the lack it's of Jesus is, in the It's batter. a lack of baking skill. You can taste um, the sacrilege. So <laughs> if you want to, you, you can taste the sacrilege. Well, maybe that would taste. That would make it taste better. Maybe it's that my Christian upbringing that hinders my ability to bake cookies. Who knows? But if you're trying to figure out whether an organization does better or worse, one of the things, especially later in my life after getting involved here, that's most important is what effect does it have on the minds of its members, right? Because you can do all the charity in the world, mm -hmm. but if you won't do charity with those insert slurs here, well, sure, you're providing some positive benefit, but if you refuse to care for the children of these people because, oh, well, these people are these people and they're therefore sinful, or you uh, hold back on placing a child in a loving home because you don't agree with the type of marriage uh, that that household is based on, or you refuse to uh, uh, have a child be adopted by a single parent regardless of how competent uh, they are because it's against your religion, well, sure, you're setting out with a kind heart and to do something good, but you're falling short. And why are you falling short? You're falling short because of the particular teachings of your religion. So in a certain sense, keep the part that works, which is the charity and the organizing and the logistics and the getting the people out there and giving volunteers a t-shirt, but you don't have to say that a magic man died on a cross in order to help homeless people. And when you do say a magic man died on a cross, you're adding stuff that's not helpful. So whether you want to evaluate the entirety of the organization as good or bad, it's a little bit of both, but the good parts don't require magic. Yeah, to, to, to at risk of reiterating everything, you know, mm -hmm. Hitchens famously gave the, the challenge of like, can you come up with a good thing that a religious person can do or say that an atheist could not do because of their atheism? Mm -hmm. No, there's nothing there. However, can you think of an evil, terrible, monstrous thing that a religious person would do because of their religion that an atheist would not do because of their atheism? It shouldn't take you any more than a second to come up with a myriad of examples of horrible atrocities throughout, you know, throughout history done specifically in the name of religion. Meanwhile, there have been bad atheists, but there's never been anybody out there doing bad things because their atheism compelled them to do bad things, right? Yeah. And so... We see the same kind of behavior here when we see religious people picking what church they want to go to. They go to the church down the road and, ah, uh, well, they are Christian, but they don't really say it the way that I like. And they don't, and they, and they also, they bring in all these gays and they do all these other. So I'm going to go to this other church down the road that says almost the same thing, but a little bit better. So really the truth of the claim doesn't really matter for them either. They're not investigating you know, which way, whether or not this God exists, they're not investigating whether or not it's real, whether or not it's useful, practical. They're finding the one that makes them feel the happiest and that aligns with the heuristics of their worldview that they grew up with. And that's where they're going to stick. So church is an unnecessary uh, vestigial extension of that kind of thing that comes with it uh, a good benefit of community and of, of compassion and of, of, of gathering together and feeling good things and, and homogeneity of, of all these things you can point to that people like about, uh, about, you know, this, this church. But as Jamie and Christy have already very articulately pointed out, you don't need the church to get the good things. And a lot of the times the church brings on new baggage. So like, it's it's I just go back to the old Hitchens quote, you know what I mean? It's is is there anything that you can get out of a church that you couldn't get without it? No. Is there anything bad that you can get out of a church that you wouldn't get without of it? Oh fuck yes. Yes, there's lots of that. <laughs> so just you know, what's what's the point, you know? Yeah. If you're wondering whether or not a church is good or bad, probably err on the side of bad. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> it's gonna be a measure of how much uh the church does things that have absolutely nothing to do with the religion. 
There's not yeah. really a good way of saying like, oh, well, reading this particular story from this particular book has a positive impact on society. Well, no, doing charity does. It's fun to gather right. around and have story time, but it's not as good. And just picking back, piggybacking on Forrest saying vestigial, I don't know what <laughs> benefits at all the appendix in the human biology serves. Maybe there's some, but it is unnecessary, and occasionally it explodes and tries to kill you. And that's yep. not the worst analogy for religions in the modern era. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah. Jacob, what do you think? I really like that. I really like the kind of standard you guys set of uh, judge it by its effect on the minds of its people. Um, that, that, that kind of opens up a whole new thing and gets me out of that annoying loop that they keep throwing me through while passing the buck. Uh, one other question, if I may, uh, the, I, I can see when I'm going down this with all the, you know, arguments I have, uh, with theists and stuff is like when they say, Oh, it's the effects of the minds of the people. Well, that's not the church though. That's, that's Satan. That's evil trying to like snake its way in. And, and how do you guys combat that when they kind of deflect from, okay, the church is having this effect on the people and the people are uh, taking, you know, our negative effect. And they say, oh, that's not the church. That's actually, you know, demons or whatever. How do you guys combat that? I got one. Is it. Uh, is Satan more powerful than God then? Because, like, if I was God in charge of everything, all powerful and magical, and then I found out that some dude is fucking up my work and hurting the people who follow me and love me the most, I wouldn't allow it because that would be a dumb and shitty thing to do. So either Satan is more powerful than God and is allowed to do more things, or God is allowing Satan to do all these terrible things to the people who love him and worship him and trust him the most, which is really, really fucked up, or neither of them exist. And what we're seeing here is natural variation in human nature played across religions and cultures as you would expect it to be in a naturalistic model. Okay, so you tie it back to those arguments of, hey, if he exists, he's an asshole or a dumbass, or if he or he just doesn't exist. Okay, I really like pretty that. Pretty much every you're apologetics argument falls back to that for me because it's often, you know, oh, well, Satan's doing these bad things. God can stop him. Well, hmm. God doesn't want to reveal himself to us. Doesn't Satan know that God exists? And he also chose not to follow him, so it wouldn't violate free will at all for God to be... The, so it's, it's just this weird-ass test... Of what? Also, you know, who are you going to allow to be punished the most? Here we have three atheists on the screen, and these two guys are incredibly kind, generous, giving, thoughtful, compassionate people. There's me. I'm kind of a dick. But, like, these guys are great. And so, like, you have these guys showing that you don't need this religion to be a good person. And meanwhile... Al Qaeda is a religious organization. The KKK is a religious organization. You know, the, the 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 Lord's Resistance Army is a religious organization. Boko Haram is a religious organization. So, like, yeah, you can point to, oh, here's some charity. Also, here's all the the evil shit that comes along with it, right? Female genital mutilation, pretty uniquely religious endeavor going on right there. Maybe it's not the best idea to say, oh, well, this religion has all these good benefits and all these, and if this God is real, either he's cool with it or he's ineffective at stopping it. So either he shouldn't be worshipped, or he shouldn't be worshipped. Or, secret third option, <laughs> he's not fucking real. Yep. I feel like that I really pretty like well covers it. it. And yeah, yeah it, it very much does. And honestly, you may be a bit of a dick, but like <laughs> sometimes that's needed. And also, you're one of the most patient ones. You become approachable, which got me comfortable to call in for being, you know, a pretty hearty ex-Mormon and trying to trying to be my best to be atheist, but thank you guys so much. It means a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah we Thanks appreciate your bravery. In. We appreciate you giving us a call. Hope you have a, uh, a great holiday week. Yeah. <laughs> you guys as well. Hey, thanks so much. Take care. I say there's way more more uh, dickish ways of expressing that, you know, particularly in our culture, is it's just easy to say science builds airplanes so that we can cross the Atlantic Ocean faster. Uh, religion mm -hmm. flies them into buildings to prove a point. Yup. Yeah. Yup.
No, I uh, I hear it. Well, y'all, uh, it's been a really fun show. We have covered a lot of ground. We are well over time, so I'm going to very quickly read off this week's top five patrons. Uh, still in our number one spot is Dingleberry Jackson, number two, Oops All Singularity, Devor Valjean, Kalevi Halvetti, and number five, Left in the Leaves, with our honorable mention this week being Don Nelson. Uh, you can be one of these people on this list by going to tiny.cc slash Patreon. TH. And uh, before we start to wrap up for the week, I want to take one more chance to, ta- uh, to thank our incredible audience who came out here to join us, to keep the energy. It's so nice having you here. We appreciate everybody who came in and joined us. Mm-hmm. Those good looking people. Thank you so much. Uh, and I suppose with that, we want to remind people about uh, the prompt for next week's show. Why did Christians really burn the witches? Otherwise, thank you two fine gentlemen. Uh, really an honor and a privilege to be uh, wrangling all of your various uh, ideas <laughs> and, and speeches. Great time. Uh, and to everybody watching, I very much appreciate you calling in, you being here, you being a part of our community, and even those who have called in to argue with us or to disagree with us, I guess I would say uh, we don't hate you. We just think you might be wrong. Oh, say so like, love like, breaks. Or, or we at least <laughs> conclude that you have not presented sufficient evidence for yeah, us to agree yeah. with your uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We want the truth, so watch Truth Wanted live Friday at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTTW and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call TW.